Good afternoon, everybody. And for those of you in Tunisia or points east, good evening. And for those of you who are joining us from the uh, West Coast, good morning. We usually get three or four time zones here. Uh, my name is Bill Granara, and I am the director for the Center for Middle Eastern Studies. And it is my extraordinary pleasure to open this year's, this is our second year of our Tunis Tunisia newsreel in which we um, have the privilege of hosting um, the best and the brightest of Tunisians who uh, give talks to us and inform us about what's going on in the ground today in Tunisia. Um, uh, we am Shatawi, who will be introduced formally by uh, Siham, our office manager, Siham Lamin, um, is, will be speaking to us, uh, not about the very, very current events, what's going on in Tunisia today, but something a little bit different. And I just want to express my tremendous gratitude to both uh, to we am and of course, always to uh, Siham. So again, to our wider audience, I welcome you back to our Tunisia newsreel. Um, things are opening up in Tunisia, and uh, hopefully we'll all be back there swimming in the beaches and eating wonderful fish uh, sooner than we think, inshallah. Anyway, uh, without further ado, uh, again, I want to turn my, the microphone over to my, <clears throat> my uh, wonderful uh, colleague, um, Siham uh, Amin, who is our office manager in Tunisia, and she will um, introduce our wonderful speaker today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Granara. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm extremely happy to be here today with Professor Granara for this uh, inaugural session of uh, our uh, Tunisia newsreel, Notes from the Ground. Um, um, to start with, I, I would like to say that originally uh, this talk uh, was subtitled uh, Tunisia in the post-2011 era, but um, it looks like a change of era has occurred, and now uh, we call it uh, Tunisia post 2015. Uh, July 25th, so this is um, a joke. But uh, this is to say also that this is an exercise in immediate history. Uh, news are evolving here as we speak. Uh, it's, so it's not an easy ta task and we know that for our guest speakers to be commenting on such moving grounds and I'm extremely grateful uh, to uh, primarily to WM uh, for accepting this uh, invitation. So it's a pleasure and honor to welcome you, uh, Wiem Shetewi. Wiem is a public policy specialist. Her work has primarily focused on security sector governance and public policy communication. She's a professor, professor agrégé at the University of El Manar in Tunis, where she focuses on pedagogy and training innovation as paths to policy reform. She is currently the president of OSAE, the Observatory for Food Sovereignty and Environment, and she holds a master's degree in public policy from Oxford University. Welcome, Wien. So this talk is structured a bit differently from what we usually do. It's an interview. So I'll ask a couple of questions for, for the next 30 minutes, and then we will open the floor um, for discussion. Uh, so Wien uh, wrote an article that was published in Jadalia in uh, August 1st, 2021, and uh, titled uh, Tunisia, Western Pundits or Hot Take Arsonists. Uh, the article was an eye-opener to many people, and in the paper, uh, written after an intense week, uh, um, so um, basically a week after July 25th, uh, uh, on the, one of the most difficult months in uh, Tunisian recent history, uh, she criticizes the lack of context and the poorly informed um, analysis uh, seen specifically in the international media coverage that relayed the, immediately uh, the, the, the events uh, after July 25th. And uh, she criticizes the marginalization of a large fragment of the voices coming from the ground and expressed by Tunis Tunisians themselves. But what uh, she's also doing uh, by pointing these non-balanced and possibly dangerous journalistic narration is saying that our understanding of these responses is, an import is as important as our understanding of the event itself. So the reactions are key for the apprehension of the complexity surrounding July 25th. And uh, what the paper suggests is that we are facing a situation where the periphery informs about the core. 
and they should not be neglected as a source. And implicitly, um, what you are telling us, Guillaume, is that the various responses to July 25th should be seen and treated as elements inherent to the event itself. So this talk is somehow a follow-up on your article, uh, two months only, or two months, maybe two months is enough, after its publication. So I will start by asking you um, to, if you can, please give us a bit of context um, and uh, what happened on that night of July 25th in Tunisia. And if you can also tell us the reasons that made the shift of power possible and the factors that prepared for its re reception and let's say relative acceptance by a non-negligible part of the public opinion that later proved to be a majority um, and, um, and also a non-negligible part of the Tunisian political and intellectual sphere. So you um, aim the floor, which is yours, for context and reasons. Thank you, uh, Sihem. Um, thank you for that introduction, and thank you, Professor Granara. Um, yeah, that article definitely um, received a lot of uh, responses. Uh, it was quite unexpectedly controversial. I, I expected some kind of reaction um, from international uh, you know, journalists and uh, analysts uh, who, uh, in some sense, I did target with the critique, but uh, what I didn't expect was how much reaction I also got from fellow Tunisians who either uh, very much felt heard uh, and uh, empathized or perhaps uh, just simply had thought the same thoughts versus others who uh, were extremely upset and felt that either A, focusing on international uh, representations of what happens in Tunisia is in itself a subjugation to that system and that we shouldn't even consider it, but uh, I believe that we should because it has material consequences in terms of foreign policies of those countries and in terms of other uh, kind of uh, regional dynamics that can be produced uh, through uh, basically creating narratives about the country, or uh, those who felt that um, uh, that it, it was 100% uh, inappropriate to even, uh, uh, you know, kind of create a, a division between foreign and domestic interpretations and representations, and that that was kind of somewhat uh, uh, me censoring voices, which, uh, first of all, I do not have the power or the ability to censor people with huge, you know, establishment, you know, uh, support and platforms like the New York Times journalists or other Others. So that in itself was either flattering or shocking as an interpretation of what I can or cannot do. Uh, but it was also um, kind of revealing that, uh, you know, where some of the narratives that I was critiquing fit and, you know, were useful to some of the, the, the Tunisian uh, uh, readers who, who actually either needed or used that, those arguments. Anyway, beyond the article, uh, you asked me what happened on July 25th. I think by now um, there's a kind of a, you know, a clarity that on July 25th, Tunisia's Republic Day, uh, following, you know, protests uh, that morning, uh, uh, some of which were actually still taking place when the president uh, made his uh, announcement, um, the president uh, invoked an article in the constitution that he believes gives him the ability to um, uh, respond, take exceptional measures that respond to imminent danger to statehood, national security, and the country's independence. And um, this article allowed him to take any measures necessitated by the exceptional circumstances, according to the text of the, of the constitution. Um, and as such, he decided that he would um, uh, you know, fire or dismiss uh, uh, the head of government, Tisha Mashishi. Uh, he also decided that he would freeze the assembly's work, which is not exactly part of that constitutional article, actually it should be in session uh, during the implementation of Article 80, uh, that he would lift immunity off of the members of parliament and that he would um, uh, commit to appoint a new head of government. He even touched on the idea that he might take prosecutorial functions to deal with the cases against some of the parliamentarians, but that was, you know, not implemented in the end in the final kind of uh, announcement around those exceptional measures. Um, the longer story of that is, is uh, you know, was this expected or not? Uh, and I think that some people were very much shocked by what happened, uh, worried or happy. 
Um, but I do know people who weren't even working in politics. Um, my father included, actually. Uh, he called <laughs> that same day, right? You know, that same day, he was like, okay, this is what's going to happen. And, and it was really interesting Thing because keen observers, I think, uh, were uh, aware that Kais Syed had, uh, over his campaign and even before his campaign, um, spoken about his dissatisfaction with the 2014 constitution. He was presented, and he is, a specialist in constitutional law. He uh, spoke about the, uh, the dissatisfaction with the electoral system. And so it was seen that there might be, there, there was a kind of a fever, you know, kind of a, 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 calm, a boiling point that was reached uh, also uh, in the political kind of uh, atmosphere where, um, you know, the, the, the scenes from the parliament were exaggeratedly becoming scandalous, actually, you know, scenes of violence in the parliament, uh, the situation with the COVID uh, pandemic and how it was handled in those recent months was, you know, to say the least catastrophic. Uh, uh, there was a lot of disorganization in that. Uh, and then there were also other issues. Uh, I think the social uh, tension, especially in, in, in certain neighborhoods, disadvantaged and, and impoverished and marginalized neighborhoods, uh, were, was, was becoming extremely uh, dramatic. Uh, we saw what was happening in Sidi Hassin with police abuse uh, captured on video um, that had reached levels that were quite shocking. And uh, I think all of this, you know, kind of uh, created uh, an opportunity uh, for those of us who want to think that perhaps Khai Syed saw an opportunity and grabbed it to uh, uh, catalyze uh, popular anger, street uh, manifestation or street protests uh, to reach the point where that night he managed to uh, uh, declare those exceptional measures. Um, I think that one way of looking at that and kind of justifying that it might have been planned is, you know, some people, um, I remember um, uh, Haytham S. Gesni, uh, a fellow Tunisian and analyst and, uh, and activist, was saying that um, when he was observing things, uh, he, he, he kind of studied where these calls for the July 25th morning protests were coming from. And, you know, the, the, they had the same kind of amorphous, uh, unclear, diffuse nature that even Kais Syed's campaign had, where it wasn't organized, you couldn't really connect it to a specific political party or, or NGO or, or any of that. It was kind of a diffuse, but somehow very kind of uh, present, uh, a call. Um, so some people said it was a youth council, but then, you know, others said, no, we, we were also part of this uh, call for this protest and we have nothing to do with that national youth council. So it was really interesting to see how some people predicted it. Um, Kai Said himself had uh, showed his dissatisfaction with, uh, with a lot of those uh, elements that uh, seem to be appearing now where he is uh, uh, speaking or at least Actually, he's not, but people in the, you know, close to the presidency have said that uh, he might uh, consider working on changing the electoral system or even the political system towards a more presidential one, uh, that the constitution will be changed, et cetera, et cetera. So that in itself is kind of what happened that night. And, and, um, and uh, it was quite interesting to, to observe that. Um, now, you asked me also what are the reasons that may have made this possible. I might go into a bit of a long answer here, so I hope you will let me know when I'm taking too long. Um, because I, I, um, I think that to answer this question about what factors led to this reception, perhaps acceptance, opposition, where, what are the sentiments, what are the, the different moods, if you will, um, that have led to, to that. Um, I'll preface this by saying that I give long answers, not only because, you know, I have to give maybe context that goes 10 years uh, ago, not just, uh, uh, not just uh, 10 weeks, uh, which is the, the date, uh, the amount of time that separates us from, uh, from the July 25th decision, uh, but uh, because I'm, uh, the reason why I give long answers is also because I'm, I have a literary background. And my literary background uh, makes me think of uh, politics and policy as not being fully detached from things like feelings and emotions. And so that's why I'm going to kind of touch on that a little bit. Um, and I think feelings and emotions do matter more, you know, not more, but as much as material conditions of the historical context that we study events through. Um, and so there were different stages that 
you know, kind of we experienced since 2010. And um, those first stages, I think, are very important be exactly because of the emotions and the sentiments that they inspired. Um, I'm sure that some, you know, political theorists, psychosociologists probably said this better, but during the 2011 uprising, we noticed a kind of a, a, a elan in French, like a kind of a wave or, or kind of a, a wave, I would say, uh, of solidarity, communion among Tunisians. Uh, this was, you know, on Facebook, the sharing of the same profile picture, literally all of Facebook in Tunisia seemed to have the same profile picture. But also there was this kind of complete breakdown of barriers among Tunisians even among strangers on the streets. I don't know if you or other Tunisians remember uh, in the early days in 2011, that uh, ability that we had to just, you know, there were literally circles and bubbles of conversations on avenues in different cities, even if there was no protest planned and you can just join a conversation bubble and, and start talking to people. And people were talking about, you know, um, theories, even uh, policies where they, you know, they also were forming and reforming uh, oral histories. Uh, of what had happened, the series of events that had led to January 14, 2011. And that first elan means a lot to me uh, because of uh, not only like the memories I keep of that time, uh, but it's also a key period where uh, feeling and doing uh, combined. Uh, and here I kind of, you know, touch a little bit on uh, recent readings I had, which I really enjoyed that of, uh, of Lauren Berlant's kind of affect theory. Um, but that combination of feeling and doing combined, um, were not only kind of, uh, uh, they were important not only to those who were politically organized, it was kind of very easy for everyday people to kind of join marches, it even felt necessary to not be disaffected, to ask what was happening, to join a movement or NGO. And it was a key period that had kind of a mood of sorts, uh, that's necessary to revisit, I think, if we are to remind ourselves uh, of how we can go beyond the prevailing mood that uh, kind of continued up until the recent uh, events of July 25th, which were very much moods that were uh, predominantly um, uh, predominated by this feeling of like loneliness and defeatism that I, I anecdotally, but also, I mean, rates in, in in uh, reach for help, for psychological help, for, for mental health help had increased in Tunisia on TV and in interviews and Vox Box kind of sessions, you see a lot of defeatism and, and questions coming in um, uh, and, and uh, being communicated uh, as in, you know, there's, you can't do anything. This is how politics is. It's horrible. You know, they're all the same, you know, elect, you know, elections don't matter. My voice doesn't matter, etc. And right now, actually, if you see two strangers in Tunisia, as opposed to then, um, you know, meeting at a protest or more likely even meeting in, you know, a bus station, uh, it's a lot more commiseration and kind of a very needed uh, sharing of anger and dissatisfaction, uh, but a lot less uh, communication about, um, um, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 the solutions or, or, or even kind of, uh, more kind of uh, constructive conversations. So it's a, uh, it's a lot of disgust. It's a lot of anger uh, against political elite, the government, um, the system of governance, etc. And so this exhaustion has set in. And I think that the transition from that first mood to of, of like this excitement, and this uh, solidarity and this uh, uh, kind of desire to change things around to this new one is the result not of a necessarily a, a, a lack of political maturity, which is often the reason given. You know, Tunisia is new, and so it takes time, and and uh, and uh, and so it's normal that people couldn't organize enough to achieve better outcomes after 2011. Um, I think it's very much a uh, an immediate the, the 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 result of an immediate focus on performative democracy very early on. Um, and so that internalization of Tunisia's story, uh, sorry, and that internationalization of Tunisia's story and its fate, which very quickly turned it into a, a site of study for international democratic theorists or political scientists, sorry, transitional democ democratic transition theorists and, and political scientists, but also, you know, a, a whole industry of NGOs and, and people whose expertise was to come in and kind of build, you know, the structures and the, and the forms of democracy. 
Um, and it was, of course, also supported by, you know, sort of political parties or movements that intended to become political parties that wanted immediately to find ways of uh, and modalities to structure systems of power where they could have, you know, that power, uh, but did not allow very much uh, that idea uh, of giving time for the diagnosis of issues for holding actually democratic delocalized dialogues around core issues, around taking concrete action very early on, on accountability, which muhasba, muhasba was one of the things that we heard the most in those early days in 2011. And while you know, reports were written and investigations were made, the, the amount of time that, that was dedicated and the kind of institutionalization of these practices uh, kind of went into extremes at some point in my humble opinion, uh, that kind of mm, allowed that defeatism, that kind of uh, to set in, and and that uh, deflated a lot of the of that original energy, um, and so this idea of quickly pushing for the organization of you know electoral elections, which is great, you know elections are you know needed, but the without the foundation uh, and an understanding of what the goals were of these democratic politics and what the um, who the beneficiaries were, it ended up with this performative, highly applauded democracy um, that you know very quickly left people's demands repeatedly ignored after every election cycle. And the co-optation even took some political parties and activists by surprise. I think some of them made it had to make a choice, um, especially the political parties, be excluded from the spectacle at the risk of losing even the little bit of access that you can get uh, by working within the, uh, the margins. Um, uh, or uh, and hope for another, you know, elan or wave to take place, or join the spectacle and attempt to keep it in check, um, in favor of work that actually responds to people's needs. And and these two choices, unfortunately, what we saw is that we haven't seen the full potential of joining the spectacle, joining, you know, the the very early on, you know, kind of democratic game, uh, democratic game of electoral politics without building foundations, without trying to kind of assess and take stock. We didn't see how, how that uh, could allow them to do the kind of base foundational work at the same time. What we saw is even parties that had relatively revolutionary ideas or wanted, you know, or at least through their platforms or the way they communicated, wanted to get things done on the ground in communities that have been marginalized ended up obviously being uh, spending lots of time in political maneuverings in the parliament um, in ways that uh, again it's it's correct it's it's a process there is a process but the timelines and the prioritization i believe were, were problematic um and so um what Kaisai did really represented a disturbance, both in his, now we get to Kaisai, <laughs> both in his uh, campaign and, uh, and on July 25th, he, he, a disruption of sorts. Uh, the campaign did not take place on the media realm, but rather outside of it, which, you know, uh, that's one dis key disruption of how things are done, keeping in mind that all the other parties had to spend so much more time, even the opposition parties and the ones that tended to communicate these kind of revolutionary aims, uh, spent so much time trying to fit on the media platforms, trying to communicate and, and do things the way that the bigger, more well-funded parties did things, like in Nahda, that, uh, that in the end they did very little on the ground communication. And here I'm thinking of the far left parties in Tunisia, if we can call them far left. Um, and so um, Kaisai had very much operated outside that realm, which was that first disruption. The second one, uh, and, and that was welcomed by people who were disaffected uh, with, you know, uh, and, and who were waiting for that new wave or elan. The euphoria on Ju July 25th was definitely palpable, and the desire for that disruption was definitely clear. Uh, um, the fear and the concern among the opposition was also palpable, uh, and I find that interesting as well, um, because what we saw is that the fear, the immediate fearful re response um, is obviously 
warranted. I myself have concerns and uh, continue to have had concerns and continue to have concerns about, you know, one man rule, etc, dictatorship, the loss of democratic gains. But I had so much more. And here I speak as a Tunisian, uh, I had so much more um, frustration with the continuous um, uh, obstacles that were posed in the face of any actual reform initiative, um, reform in the sense of actually, you know, making sure that policies respond to, to democratic demands, to people's demands on the ground. Um, and we saw the, the state of parliament, we saw the repeated uh, uh, choice to, 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 to pass laws that are actually quite problematic if we compare them to the constitution and if we compare them to the, the early demands of 2011. We're talking here about uh, 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 passing, for example, the, the amnesty law for corrupt uh, officials. We're talking uh, about the, uh, the, the repeatedly returning, but thankfully not yet passed law on uh, on uh, uh, preventing attacks on the police, you know, uh, uh, where whereas it's it's not necessarily actually we need an opposite law that uh, that actually protects citizens from police abuse, um, if we are to to design such a law. So um, and we saw that there was repeatedly a, a failure uh, of of state institutions. Uh, they were uh, especially public services, uh, the uh, you know the health, the health sector, the educational sector. All of these things were building a lot more um, anger and and actual fear uh, about the complete uh, uh, collapse. Much more so than you know the idea of of um, a glitch in the democratic process, which uh, I trust Tunisian people could very easily. Um, counter and find ways around um, through their their ability to be on the ground and outside, so that that little glitch or, or blip we'll we'll see where it ends up heading. Um, it is, uh, in my opinion, um, something that, when compared to the to the to the 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 down kind of downward trend of the past ten years. Um, I just worry about the 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 the, the rel basically the relative you know the rel relativism and the ability to ignore uh, what has kind of become a backdrop a nuisance an acceptance that you know there's a pain in the neck about what's happening to our national industries and our national public services and they're kind of like in the background and we've got grown accustomed to them um, and we've grown accustomed to the endemic you know kind of corruption and I don't say this you know about everyone I myself as and part of that kind of workforce in the kind of uh, NGO world and the political analysis world and the uh, and the uh, political observer world. It doesn't mean that we don't care um, about precarious labor, about food dependency, about high foreign debt, about failing public services. But it's just that it kind of operates outside of the clearly defined deliverable based work uh, for funding partners or donors. And so it very quickly became those things became very much questions where people on the mar questions on the margin demanded and discussed and 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 um, uh, you know discussed by people on the margin people who themselves uh you know the protests in rural areas the protests in in, in among farming groups the protests in areas that have no access to water etc those are not as represented as questions uh that have been raised, for example, since July 25th, um, and other questions uh, that are kind of discussed in Tunis and, and its whereabouts. So that's kind of one of what I'm trying to touch on here. So um, I gen genuinely think that 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 operate not you know the the kind of work that we've been doing um, has kind of uh, worked in favor of. Um, forgetting a little bit about those questions. And then there's also the question of consensus, consensus high level politics. And with that kind of uh, big influx of uh, democracy experts and transitology experts and, and, uh, and with that influx of kind of, uh, and uh, as well as, sorry, an ideological tendency uh, to see uh, that kind of democratic gains as, as, as being very much bound within a certain framework uh, of consensus politics. Uh, we've kind of very quickly um, begun to see this kind of um, um, 
uh, obsession with 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 the consensus with what you know kind of Americans call reaching across the aisle. I mean, even no matter who's on the other side, even if you know it makes us more and more resemble the people on the other side. Um, and I think that that in itself is something interesting to study uh, because it very quickly decisively became bad to have contention within this democratic, you know, uh, Morris that we've developed in Tunisia. Uh, and obviously good to have consensus and to try and have, you know, national dialogue, but always within a certain group of, you know, elite high level official democratic, uh, sorry, a political uh, elite. Um, and I think that it's not really debatable. I don't think it's up for debate that um, the processes so far, national dialogues, et cetera, have not been truly inclusive. Um, so in coupled with this kind of devastatingly poor policy making, uh, seeing that the solution each time is, uh, you know, oh, okay, we have a crisis, let's have a consensus, you know, I think that became distasteful to people. So that's where another disruption uh, occurred with Kais Syed. So he, he, he broke a series of norms. Um, first is kind of the link especially in the early days uh, after July 25th, I think there was this acceptance. I think now more and more, you know, there's concern. Uh, we're still kind of observing, but uh, there's definitely concerns. Uh, but very early on, there was this idea that he was breaking a series of norms. The first one I think is the link between feeling and doing um, that I mentioned earlier. Um, so this, you know, aside sometimes by his oppos opposition, I saw someone recently call him the, the kisser of the shoulders. Um, uh, I saw this kind of nickname against him um, because he tends to hug people who come to the palace, people who are supposed to be, represent the marginalized or the, you know, the, the, the unemployed, the poor, and kind of this is represented as kind of populist pop politics. Um, and so this idea of him kissing shoulders, like that's the feeling, right? That's the pathos. Um, and, but he also managed to, in the eyes of the supporters, combine the feeling with the doing. So that kind of, I hear you and I see you that you see a lot in American politics and also in Tunisians, you know, and if him come, I understand you, but if it stops there, you know, that's not enough. And so the idea that he chose to do something radical, to cut, to dismiss, to even go against the constitution, there was that meme that was shared widely on July 25th at night and, and July 26th in the morning. It's this, uh, you know, sassy young girl who says, we know it's a coup and we're okay with it. I mean, that's, you know, problematic, but at the same time, there was that, that very kind of, uh, you know what, he's doing something. Um, and I think that's, you asked about the reception and the acceptance, and I think that's where uh, some of it lies. Um, and then, uh, even if it's you know a dangerous departure from the everyday apathy, it is still a departure uh, from that feigned concern uh, that people have gotten used to from politicians. Second of all, it was a break from the consensus, which I talked about. Um, and then uh, I think he broke the norms of operating within the system and its constraints. I have a very funny anecdote about this that I'd like to share with you, Sihan, because I know that you're interested in urban uh, and it's your specialty, right? <laughs> um, so um, the, 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 the idea that Kaiside is operating outside of, you know, the, the limits of the constitution or even bending it, et cetera. I think it, it, it resonated a little bit with people who felt suffocated by certain um, things. You know, you, this came after a period of very ineffective and very harsh and very long series of either curfews or, you know, uh, um, lockdowns. Uh, that weren't supporting people who didn't have access to, you know, money or fun, you know, uh, food or people who live, you know, day to day in terms of money, and then to and then to to have to feel constrained and suffocated in that sense. It also happens in terms of how people sometimes live everyday life. And um, one anecdote I have is is uh, building permits. Uh, for your home or your shop front, you know, you have to keep four meters from the front of the house, you have to keep 15 or 10 meters from the middle of the axis of the road that's in front of your house, so you can't build on your full property. Well, since, since July 25th, I have heard multiple anecdotes and multiple reports from friends who are architects and, and, and engineers saying, you know what, people are building like mad. People are currently doing whatever they want because they feel that after Kaisayed, you know, 
uh, the Teletib officials, the ones that work for the MOI at the moment, who, who check, who audit, you know, these kinds of things, are not concerned by these uh, silly kind of rules. They are, there's a bigger battle right now against corruption. And, uh, and this country is currently kind of, uh, you know, this is your window to, to build that extra floor or to gain that extra meter as an extension in your home or whatever. So I think that's a really interesting, um, almost... Uh, I don't know if it's a metaphor, but it's it's a, it's almost like an interesting representation of that will to kind of uh, break boundaries a little bit. And seeing him as someone who was a, kind of a, a, a breaker of boundaries through his constitutional acrobatics. Um, and then um, the other th way that he's kind of breaking, you know, that mold, um, I think, is very much the way that we see. Um, uh, the, the night, the night itself, when people came out, uh, you know, there's a curfew in place, you know, Kaisai announces that he, he did not announce that the curfew was not in place. He did not announce that, you know, that's it, you can go out after, you know, 10 p.m. Or, or what was it? And yet that was the first reaction. Obviously, it was a very good thing for him politically, you know, that people went out on the streets. Um, but the very, you know, the very kind of uh, impetus that had people go out and the disregard for the curfews almost, may, again, gives the idea that Kai Sayed is now, you know, breaking all those walls down, uh, which I thought was really interesting because he's quite a rigid character and quite the legal kind of uh, stickler. Um, so that perception of him as a, as a liberator from rigidity, I think is really interesting. Uh, just as currently this perception of him as, you know, someone who is uh, appointing women, uh, you know, as ambassador to the US and as head of government, uh, it's exciting, it's interesting, you know, for these, you know, uh, fellow women and, and for Tunisia's precedent in that sense. But I think that it's also important to keep in mind that Kai Syed has a hold pretty conservative views on a lot of questions, uh, as he, when he, which about which he was interviewed uh, prior to his campaign, uh, in terms of social um, progressive values, etc. So um, I think that um, the idea um, of why and how it was accepted, I think very much Kai Syed had a lot of factors helping him in that sense uh, that I've mentioned so far. Um, what made it possible, I think also, interestingly enough, and I'm borrowing this analysis from a friend and analyst, uh, Tunisian as well, Habib Sayeh, is this idea that uh, if Kai Syed's lack of party backing and lack of representation in parliament kind of made him a one a one uh, a one man show in a sense, and because he was president, um, his plans for changing the constitution, his plans for you know uh, changing the regime, perhaps we 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 hear echoes of this, uh, the the political I mean system, um, all of this I think could have only been done uh, if he were indeed president and if he kind of did this kind of thing with the constitution. Um, and so whether it was, you know, a master plan or not, but, uh, but the very, the very plan he had and the fact that he didn't have that, he wasn't, a, you know, a member of parliament, the, the fact that he was a one man solitary kind of um, uh, uh, a force of sorts has allowed him to uh, make that call uh, and use that article. Um, I think I'm speaking for a long time, but I know um, that uh, we'll what have a chance to talk about more things. We yeah. are, since this was a lecture in itself, we will skip the rest of the questions <laughs> and go directly to to the to to the questions from the audience. I mean, this is exactly. this was excellent. It was very hard to interrupt you. Thank you very much. This is extremely insightful. <laughs> Thank so you. So, if you would like to wrap this up or conclude on this and then we'll take the first question there is a question very, very interesting question on performance on the spectacle and um yeah. so as you wish i can read the question if you if you would like to to wrap this part and then we and we skip to the question i yeah, think uh, i think i've i've said basically everything so i'll i'll i'll, uh, I'll wait for the uh, questions so so the, the first question is um, uh, is about the spectacle and how do you see the role of international NGOs and international funding in um, in consolidating a particular kind of neoliberal democracy in Tunisia as opposed to one composed of the Tunisian people 
um, revolutionaries. Yeah, very interesting. So how do you see the role of international NGOs and international in consolidating a particular kind of neoliberal democracy in Tunisia, as opposed to one composed of the Tunisian people? I, I definitely see that, that that is a role that is in itself uh, the result of the history of international development. I think it's, it's not detached from it, right? There's a, from the 60s or 70s onwards, I think the 70s more like it, um the you know that kind of that became an industry in itself and industries have their norms they have their standards they have their operating procedures and they have you know their own culture uh and it to many to to, to a great extent uh it's very difficult to deviate from those to, from those uh, approaches and cultures uh, I have myself worked in such uh, institutions. I have friends who worked in many others. I, I don't have as much experience, but I can I can say that that uh, the 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 very structure of a lot of these organizations, uh, uh, despite all the good intentions that those who work in them might have, uh, is built around uh, a question of demand and supply in terms of funding opportunities. And you know, I touched on this in the Jadalia article that I wrote. Um, there is a real um, pressure uh, on people who work in such institutions to deliver uh, clear deliverables uh, with indicators of success that fit certain ideas of cert success, certain norms of success. And uh, many of these tend to be, you know, uh, based on quantity, based on uh, based on fulfilling the ideological. Uh, tendencies of the funder himself. So one thing we've seen in Tunisia is a huge uh, amount of funding uh, that went to entrepreneurship, to uh, uh, opportunities for, for, yeah, to entrepreneurship for youth, youth entrepreneurship. Um, what that did was it, it ended up very much uh, pushing the idea that um, success is, in the Tunisian context is through a liberalization of you know opportunities for um, creating enter you know creating companies etc for youth and that if you know that that was the best path to move forward uh, and it ended up being quite problematic in the end in terms of the opportunities for finance for for such youth uh, lots of uh, I think studies have been written around the world but there were I think a couple I can't remember who wrote them here that focused on how they ended up being about the low hanging fruit the people, the youth who ended up getting those opportunities and succeeding in them the most were the ones who already uh, would have because of being in Tunis or Sousse or Sfax uh, or because of a certain educational level. Um, the microfinancing initiatives were not, you know, we, that's a whole debacle and issue around the world as well. Um, and so there are obviously ideological tendencies and then there's also the, 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 the kind of, of perpetuation of those uh, of the system, uh, of who the funding partners are, of who the funders are, of the way that this kind of structure fits into an international um, order of um, countries financing such initiatives. Um, and I, I think there's a lot to say about that, but I, I hope I answered the question even a little bit. And, and, and the question was about as opposed to Tunisian uh, solutions. Um, I think, unfortunately, we haven't had the opportunity to really, really hear about the Tunisian solutions. Um, there's a lot of uh, 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 the, the writing by certain people in Tunisia at universities uh, about potential solutions within NGOs, about solutions. There's people who are talking about, you know, food sovereignty. There's people talking about the water issues. You know, there's a uh, Nomad, uh, there's a uh, OZE, uh, there's the uh, Tunisian the Association for Permaculture. And there's a lot of, uh, there's the, the network on food sovereignty. There's a lot that's being done on that stuff. There's all other uh, organizations that are working on solutions for other issues. Um, you'll be meeting with Muheb, Shaima, and he's like different people who are coming up with different things. Um, but I, I think that the what has not happened is uh, an actual uh, national initiative at the public level uh, that promotes 
uh, uh, writing that promotes thinking, that offers time and opportunities for people to really, really focus on, on that kind of, of uh, coming up with those solutions, as well as a political initiative to really be inclusive. We haven't seen that yet. So I would love to know what the Tunisian solutions would look like. I can tell you what some of you know, my friends think and what some of my colleagues think, uh, but until we have an actual national consciousness of the importance of developing such solutions, uh, I think we'll still hear more from external voices than we would from internal ones, domestic ones. And we have there is another question on NGOs and foreign institutions. And do you think they are disconnected from the Tunisian political reality? And they are continuing funding and implementing projects, so told as democratics, without reviewing the current situation? Is this a critique you have? Are disconnected from the Tunisian political reality. They're continuing funding and implementing projects without reviewing the current. I think that I think that there is a, a, a desire to to study the democratic the reality, uh, but again, the issue is not the desire to study because when you're studying things, your lens and your background very much affects how you see things. So if you are study, you know, trying to work on democratic transition in Tunisia, you you're already set up to think through that lens of democratic ideals and focusing on electoral policies and focus, focusing on youth inclusion in politics, which is fine. Um, but is it tackling the bigger, the bigger questions or, or, or more questions? I don't think there are enough organizations looking at the underrepresented realities of Tunisia. I, this is a you know interesting question because I you hear people, for example, political analysts and, and researchers writing Tunisia, you know, saying, I met with Tunisians or or I um, I spoke to the real Tunisians, you know, who are the real Tunisians? You know, there's this kind of uh, image, this imaginary in a lot of these uh, international, you know, uh, observers and, 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 uh, and, uh, and researchers minds and, and journalists minds of the real Tunisian often being, you know, um, a certain kind of Tunisian. I, I don't want to further entrench the stereotypes in people's minds, so I'm not going to uh, describe it, but um, I, I take issue with that. So, so the idea of, uh, you know, the reality in Tunisia is so complex. Um, and until, you know, international NGOs and funding organizations um, stop with the, you know, obsession with hiring, uh, with not hiring domestic uh, researchers and analysts in top managerial positions uh, and continuously, you know, thinking that, no, no, we need, you know, such and such a profile, often, you know, a specific white profile uh, to be leading the program with other people kind of doing less, um, you know, uh, design work or, or, or conceptual work or or policy work or, you know, thinking of the alternative solutions themselves, I think that is in itself a problem. And, and, and I'm not, you know, being radical here. This is something that's been discussed in the development world for, for years and years and years. So I don't think they don't want to be, I don't think they intentionally want to be disconnected. I think they're, they're just the operating procedure and the, and the way that you approach a problem defines what you will end up seeing. And William, this is a question from Matt. I'm wondering if you see any organizational structure or leadership in the current pro or anti Said protests in the streets or cacophony of voices in the public sphere, uh, whether from prior or new kinds of social movements, NGOs that work on constitutional law or democratization, etc. So, an alternative. Um... <laughs> So a pro, so is there an organizational structure in the current pro or anti Syed protests on the streets or Other whether from prior or new kinds of so do we see organizational structures basically whether they are pro or for or, or anti that work on constitutional law democratization. Um, I'm trying to understand the question I, I, I think that. Um, Right now, different organizational structures or already established ones have communicated their stances. Uh, some of them do work on constitutional law. Some of them are, uh, you know, the, the unions and the syndicates of different lawyer groups and, and judges groups. Um, 
Um, is that, did I understand the question correctly, Sihan? Do you think that's what uh, Matt intended? I, I, would understand that. I think so, yes. Maybe the role of yeah, parties. I, I, would, I would include the role of parties and what they are, what they are doing, but uh, maybe Matt, you can... You can write a follow-up. Okay, so he said he says Manishim Seymach, are there any movements coming out in coalitions? Uh, there were there were definitely um, attempts to so these so you mean uh, uh, new ones as opposed to pre-established ones. Matt. Mm. Uh, there was definitely an initiative that was launched that was very interested. It, it interesting. It had a lot of uh, points that they wanted to work on. Um, they, it was calling for feedback. They had launched, uh, you know, uh, online surveys where you can add um, your your feedback on the kind of platform they had developed, and it was uh, it was uh, represented as a as a, a neither pro nor anti. It was one that took into account the situation and the critical situation and the need to have organization within it. Um, I am trying to remember the the name of the initiative. It was kind of like the the the, the national commission for uh, change or something like that. Um, I don't quite know where that initiative has led, but I am hopeful because a lot of those people that I saw working on that initiative uh, had also worked on uh, successful initiatives like Menshim uh, Sebah and others. So I'm I'm curious to see where that will end up leading to. Uh, an interesting thing that the phenomenon. I'm sorry, Matt, if I'm deviating from your question, uh, is that soon after the July 25th decision. Um, or measures or this announcements, um, we saw uh, uh, political parties uh, officially uh, announce their existence. There were a few, like uh, two or three that I know that are more on the left uh, that call, you know, said, you know, we're a new party, we're here. And I think there was another one that sounds very much like they are pro-Kais Syed that uh, I will share an article about. Actually, no, it's still, it's still being written, I think. Uh, um, but if the team from Mishkel is, is online, maybe they can they can let us know if that article is coming or, or published. I'm sorry, I'm not keeping up to date. But there is there is there is uh, there are political parties that are uh, arising, uh, whether in response, neither pro nor for. I can't say which. Mm -hmm. um, but there was that coalition or commission that that people are trying to create. At least that. I'm sure there's other initiatives at the local level. Um, and that's something I'm really interested in, in trying to see um, is, you know, uh, Kaisai very much had a delocalized project. So are there invisible little clusters, to, invisible to us, obviously, in, the, in, in Tunis, unfortunately, that are working uh, on, on, uh, on this kind of uh, solution development? Thank you, Ian. Listen, we have uh, six minutes left and, and wonderful questions. Uh, so I will let you choose brief. one on the on the prime, new prime minister, one uh, by Ola on the consensus and this break with performative democracy, and uh, an important one that we would leave maybe for the end is from Mohammed. And he says, "What would be your red line on an undoubtable evidence to affirm that Tunisian regime became a dictatorship?" So you can link. Okay. <laughs> okay. Between. Uh, well, regarding the prime minister, I can't say much. I think it will be very interesting to observe. I know that uh, there's the, the current debate was, you know, does it even matter whether it's a woman or is it a truly an interesting precedent? Is this a tokenism? Is a symbolism? Um, I can't really comment. I think regarding her actual uh, capabilities, you know, uh, it will be interesting to see what she does. There was an article about her role in the World Bank funded project, which uh, ended up being not very uh the project not her role uh, ended up not being not extremely uh, uh, a great use of funds from from what that one article said but uh yeah can't comment more um aula um designation as a break with consensus politics uh, it imposed an end to political infighting, but in what ways did it foster contention or allow space for alternative politics? Also, in what ways the side break with what you described as a performative democracy? Uh, what do you think are the alternatives for understanding democracy beyond liberal transitology focused on elections and institutions? Wow, that's a huge question. <laughs> um, I think uh, 
it imposed, yes, it did impose an end to political infighting in the parliament, but I think it very much created a debate and a space for, for example, Anahda and other political parties to fight back, to have their own counter narratives. Unfortunately, some of those counter narratives ended up being um, in some ways problematic themselves, uh, you know, calling on, you know, the US to interrupt aid or support, calling on uh, other countries to intervene, uh, even uh, with the army, you know, as one of the, you know, high official said, you know, the, the, the US can stop, you know, or do this to, to influence the Tunisian army. Um, so I think it's, it's, uh, it's interesting to see um, the, the infighting um, or the at least the fight the fighting can you know continue in different ways. Uh, what is interesting is that uh, for uh, a coup or a considered coup or uh, an assumed coup, um, there's been a lot of room for those for those alternative uh, uh, you know uh, narratives to emerge. Um, and then uh, it also created space for uh, infighting within the parties themselves. So um, I'll just here point to the, the divisions that are happening in Nava itself. Um, I think that's that's all I can say there. Uh, you wanted to, to work on that final question? Yes, the red line one. The red line one, please. And then we will apologize to those. I will, I will copy the questions and then send them to you. My uh, personal... My personal red line to affirm that the Tunisian regime became a dictatorship, I think the day that we see as much crackdown and violence against contentious voices as we have seen over the past 10 years, it would be uh, uh, the beginning of red line. The reality is that I felt that there has been a lot more opening of debate, and and uh, and unfortunately, I, I I can't deny it. You know, I, I have concerns about the, the the procedural elements of what has happened, but technically speaking, uh, to see the president actually uh, go out and uh, and reprimand, although I'd like to see more police officers uh, and the MOI for reacting violently to a protest that was uh, held uh, when the when where where is the head of government? was actually praising uh, police forces for their professionalism when children and thousands of youth were arrested in July and February. Uh, I think that would be uh, the beginning of the red flags for me. Right now, the only red flags I see are um, procedural, but it's still a wait and see situation. My red flags are uh, definite uh, violence against contentious voices, uh, violence against citizenry, uh, police violence, police abuse, uh, in a way that is either equal or higher than what we've experienced over the past, past 10 years, which has been dramatic. This is very clear. Hope we will never reach that point. Thank you uh, very much. It feels like um, we have, um, we need another hour um, to, to, to learn more. Um, I'm, I'm grateful to all those who attended. Uh, this was just fantastic. Um, uh, just keep uh, following the newsreel. Uh, next week will be another talk with um, uh, with uh, Anis Marrachi on more economical and more economic uh, points. And uh, it's, it's called uh, "What's Exactly Mining Tunisia's Economy." I'll go to, to all those who who had you, who you wrote questions. I will uh, copy your questions to him and. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm hoping she will have uh, some time to, to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Wiem. Uh, Professor Granara, if you would like to say a word. We, you're muted, you're muted. Again, I thank you very much for your time and your, for your explanations and your comments. They're very useful to us. And um, I look forward to seeing you in December in Tunisia, okay? Very good. And thank, thank you, you to the for audience for coming. Yeah. Thanks for the audience for the great questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you and take so, care, everyone. Goodbye. Bye.